Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Dr. Jocker's Functional Nutrition Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about red light therapy, photobiomodulation, and how the light you're being exposed to can have a great impact on your health. And so my guest today is Scott Shaveri, and he's the founder and CEO of Mito Red Light Incorporated. Uh, this is actually the red light therapy products that I personally use. I use them almost every single day. And Scott is committed to bringing the highest quality, most effective red light therapy products to market at the best value. He earned a bachelor's in psychology at, from Cornell University and an MBA from University of Rochester. As a lifelong health and wellness enthusiast, experimenter, and biohacker, Scott decided to leave corporate America to pursue his passion of empowering people to increase their vitality, maximize their health span, and become the best version of themselves. And that's how he created Mito Red. And you can check him out at mitoredlight.com. And so, Scott, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Well, certainly. And I'm interested in your story and how you got started with red light therapy. Well, it's a bit of a long story, but I'll, I'll give the concise version. I've um, been interested in health and wellness for about two decades. Um, it's been kind of a focal point of my life uh, for as far back as I can remember. Um, to me, it's always been about if you can take care of your own health first and foremost, tend to your own garden, then you can, you're better positioned to, you know, really make a positive difference in the world at large. Yeah. Yourself first, your family, your community, and then hopefully the world at large, right? So uh, it's been something I've been, been very interested in. I had some health challenges as a child. And uh, so always constantly learning and researching, trying new things. I owned the supplement company way back in the day. Um, and I've always been uh, listening to podcasts like yours to constantly educate myself. Uh, as I was working in corporate America, side by side, learning, experimenting, trying different things. And um, I came across red light therapy probably about five years ago and uh, just bought one of those large panels and started using it and realized that I was really enjoying it and that I was feeling better, had more energy, was sleeping better. Uh, and so, you know, just kind of went on using it and then kind of stopped using it for a while and sort of picked it up again and then realized that I wanted more. Uh, and so I went back out into the marketplace to buy another one of those panels and I, I, I got sticker shock by how expensive they were. Mm, yeah. Uh, I think the one that I was looking at was, you know, three foot by nine inch, uh, was almost $1,200. And so I got sticker shock, uh, as somebody that was loving it and enjoying it. Yeah. Uh, and so I decided, you know, maybe there's an opportunity here. So it was really a convergence of my own use, my own experience with, just kind of the business mindset that maybe there's an opportunity here to bring something to market that was less expensive, but just as effective. So yeah, that, that was about two and a half years ago. Okay. Yep. Yep. And why, why is the market? Cause I know that, you know, there was a couple of companies that got started with red light therapy. Why do you think that they were priced the way that they were? Is it, were these companies investing a lot into research? Was there technology that was higher cost? Uh, I think it's all of the above. I think it's a, yeah a combination of just the nature of uh, capitalism, if you will, is that yeah. in, the, in the beginning, things are much more expensive. And then True. as the demand grows, the supply grows with it and the prices come down. Right. And we're seeing that happen in the space yeah. um, because it's actually not super complicated. We know the red and near infrared wavelengths that work. We kind of know exactly mm -hmm. what the power is in general that should be used. And so, uh, so we're seeing that happen. I think there were some companies that kind of were first movers in the space about five years yeah. ago. And so they were the only ones out there so they could command a premium. And also the, uh, you know, the raw materials were more expensive at, at that time, but we're seeing yeah, price compression yeah. and we're also seeing more competitors come into the space, which is great. Yeah. Uh, more consumer choice, lower prices, better products. That's what we want to see. Yeah. It's the benefit of capitalism. Once uh, a product proves itself in the market, competitors come in, drives down the cost for the consumer. So, yep, absolutely. Well, let's talk about why red light therapy has become so popular. And we can start by this idea of photobiomodulation. What is that? How does that impact our health? Well, essentially, it's the, the impact that light has on the body. And in particular, when we talk about red light therapy or photobiomodulation, we're talking about very specific wavelengths of red and near infrared light that seem to go into the body, act on the mitochondria, help the mitochondria make energy better, 
and have been shown in now what are up to over 4,000 studies that I've seen um, have myriad benefits and all, yeah. for all sorts of different things, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, and so I think that it's it's a wonderful, <laughs> it really is a wonderful um, addition to any health and wellness routine in that it really does seem to have such broad application and it's super safe, you right. know, so it's kind of hard to do it wrong, uh, especially within the guidelines that, that we that we give. And um, and it's needed not just uh, from, you know, we can talk about science all day long, but I would also argue that we're part of the reason why people realize benefit is because of how much time we spend indoors. I think the last statistic I heard was 93% of our time is spent indoors, whereas yeah. historically we'd be out in the sun all day long, right. getting these beneficial wavelengths of light into the body. And because we're not getting that, there's definitely an argument to be made that we're deficient. Yeah. And there's five bioactive forms of light. You got blue light, you have UV light, which, which helps stimulate vitamin D production, like what we get from the sun, um, far infrared, near infrared, and red light. Okay? Yeah. And, I, and all of them at times, if we were exposed to the sun, we would be exposed to all of them. Is that correct? Throughout the course right. of the day? That's right. Yeah. And then now, red some light. Some more than others, depending on the time of the day. Right. Right. But, right exactly. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah. So if you think about it, I mean, just even when you look up in the sky at sunrise and sunset, uh, it's typically orange or red. And why is yeah. that? It's because the longer wavelengths of red light are the, the shorter wavelengths of the blue and the green, et cetera, are yeah. filtered out by the particulate in the atmosphere as they have to travel further to get to you. Mm. And so that's why uh, the red light uh, is is generally what what it, on balance you see more in the sky and uh, sunrise and sunset. Another good example of that if, is if you take a um, like a flashlight and put it up to your thumb, you know, just white light. What 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 makes it through? It's it's the red hues. I mean, all the other yeah. shorter wavelengths get filtered out by your thumb, and uh, what, sh what shines through your thumb is red. So that's another example. But so obviously we know that um, you know at midday you're getting a lot of blue. Uh, right. at midday and, and a lot of UV, it's a good time to make vitamin D. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly in the morning, probably a good idea to go out and get some sun and reboot that circadian clock. Yeah. Um, but yes, the, the red predominantly sunrise, sunset for obvious reasons. Yeah. And now near infrared, you don't see, you don't actually, can't visibly see that. Is that correct? That is correct. And we get that question very often because half of our LEDs are near infrared and yeah. many times folks are like are these things working <laughs> and so uh it, it is invisible you will only see like a soft glow come off all, uh, go off the, well you have a device you know uh, come yeah. off those leds yeah. uh but there is a if you take a solar light meter which i have here actually you take one of these solar light meters and uh hold it in front of the device with the near infrared on you will see there's a significant amount of energy coming out of that device even yeah. though you can't see it and what are the benefits of being exposed to near infrared? Well, they're very similar in the mechanisms as red light in terms of getting into the mitochondria, moving the protons from uh, the, the spot in the inner mitochondria to the spot between the inner and outer mitochondrial membrane. Mm -hmm. um, and then essentially uh, those protons want to go back, uh, you know, this, this um, equilibrium, everything's looking for equilibrium. So they want to go back across that inner mitochondrial membrane. And when that happens, the mitochondria use that potential energy to make ATP. That's kind of the nuts and bolts right. of it. So that is the same for red and near infrared, but really the difference is that near infrared penetrates deeper into the body. So it can make it further and it can make it further into the muscles. It can make it to the organs to some degree through the skulls of the brain. And, and it needs to get there in order to have, you know, a beneficial effect. You know, the problem with the blues, again, the blues and the greens, they, they have certain biological actions, but they're not going to make it through your skull to your brain. Hmm. Uh, so the near infrared can get there and it can act on the mitochondria and it can, it can do its magic. Yeah. And we see like a lot of near infrared saunas, for example, right. Which kind of are combined the heat along with that near infrared. Most of those don't have the red light though. What you're doing is combining the near and the red with these red light devices. That's right. And the red typically for the skin, uh, we see a lot of studies coming out with the eyes. There's mm -hmm. actually companies coming out with devices specifically for ophthalmologist offices, companies really? called Lumicera. Lumi uh, you, you guys can Google it. Uh, and they just got approval for distribution in Europe, I believe. And it's this 
kind of desktop device and people were going to just kind of stare into it uh, and, and get red light into the eyes. And there's really good data that it helps with macular degeneration. Um, wow. So we'll see more and more of that. But the red light typically for the skin, for hair follicles, uh, you see these helmets, you see these masks on the market. They're, they're yeah. all using the red light. And then the near infrared, again, because it penetrates deeper, uh, is able to act on different parts of the body. So the combination, right. they complement one another. Yeah, that makes sense. And so for skin issues like people having acne, for example, eczema, different things like that, scarring, we're seeing results with the, with the red light therapy on that. That's right. Well, it's known to have, so there's a couple of things. It supports, essentially the cell stimulates the cells to do whatever it is their job is. So if it's a skin cell, you know, it, it stimulates the fibroblasts to make more collagen. Yeah. Uh, but it's also known to have an anti-inflammatory effect, which I think you've talked about. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And so there's definitely potential for it to benefit these inflammatory skin conditions like acne, right. psoriasis, eczema, et cetera. Yeah. yeah Same thing with sense. near infrared and the, and things like arthritis. Right. Yep. So the near infrared will penetrate down into the joint. So somebody that's dealing with pain, having that near infrared, being able to get down deeper and into the joint, they're going to start to see more anti-inflammatory activity there. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. I think there, there's probably two main drivers. There's that and then just increased circulation. Right. You know, yep. which just promotes the healing process in general. Now, is it activating the nitric oxide pathway? Is that what's happening, causing more vasodilation in there? It is. It is. Yeah. So that that's also one of the, the mechanisms. Yeah. Um, I, and there's also, I mean, if you've used a device, there's also just yeah. a noticeable warming effect. Right. Uh, when you use it True. in your infrared, you just feel warmer from the inside out. It's yeah. very subtle. A lot of people might not even notice it. I'm a sweater. So when yeah. I stand in front of this, I have a massive <laughs> setup here. Yeah. Uh, when I stand in that uh, uh, tunnel, I sweat. Uh, but yes, there's definitely an, an internal warming effect that happens. And that's obviously, you know, promoting the circulation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it definitely makes sense with that. And obviously it's activating all those mitochondria and the mitochondria produce energy within every cell of our body. So we want really strong, healthy mitochondria. That's what gives us metabolic flexibility. You know, the ability to, to burn fat for fuel, the ability to really uh, thrive in life. You know, we know aging, accelerated aging, degenerative processes have to do with degenerative mitochondria. So anything that we can do to help stimulate the production of good, healthy mitochondria is obviously going to be important. And, you know, during the day, during at, at night, a lot of people are blocking out blue light um, to help improve their circadian rhythms, but also getting red light exposure in the mornings. You mentioned this for circadian rhythms and also at times in the evening, because it kind of uh, simulates like sunset. Is that correct? Like getting that red light exposure in the evenings can help improve sleep quality. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, you know, I will say that the anecdotal feedback we get on that is mixed. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, well, which would we would expect? I mean, the individual responses to these things is going to vary to a degree. So, cause I get asked this question a lot. When is the best time of day to use it? Yeah. Now, if we use nature as a, as a clue, uh, I might say sunrise or sunset cause on balance, right. You know, that's when red is, is the dominant wavelength that's getting to us. Yeah. Uh, uh, you could also make an argument that, you know, midday, because that's just in general, that's when the most light is getting to us. Yeah. Um, irrespective of wavelength. So I think that you can argue it. Uh, yeah, or, especially on like a rainy day, like a rainy cold day, you, you know, you can't really get out in the sun. I like to use that red light device. Okay, right. And so, and so that's your, your personal experience. And I'm certainly yeah. not going to tell you any different. Like if that's right. what you're feeling like you want yeah. to do. Um, now, as far as sleep goes, now I will say that in my own personal sleep hygiene regimen, uh, we have, a, our lights are all red and orange in our home. And so we we're, we we're purposely eliminating the blue. We eliminated the blue from the TV screens. We eliminate the blue from the computer screens. We I've got blue blocking glasses. Yeah. We've got all that kind of down. Uh, and then we, we're, we have kind of very soft ambient red. Yeah. Now there is some, there's really good study that was done in elite Chinese athletes, uh, where they gave them 30 minutes of red light therapy in the evenings and they reported massive improvements. And this is on our website, massive improvements in sleep quality, massive increases in melatonin, uh, serum melatonin in the morning that they measured. It was something like 67% increase. And 
and also just better recovery and just uh, a lot of like athletic. This was they were elite athletes, so they were seeing market improvement even in recovery markers and performance markers, which is pretty incredible. Yeah. Uh, so that would say, well, hey, use it at night and really increase that melatonin and and see and see if you sleep better. But again, we get some anecdotal feedback from people that they find it stimulating and they don't do well with it in the evenings. Right. So again, if somebody is saying that, I'm not going to tell them any different. I would say, okay, well then use it during the day. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, especially if they're using it right before bed, because it can be powerful. What I was getting at would be like kind of more mimicking sunset, you yeah. know? So for me, if I'm going to bed at 10 and I put it on at seven o'clock, it's not going to overstimulate me to where I can't fall asleep at 10. I, I noticed that as long as I keep the blue light out later, yeah. um, then I'm able to really get good quality sleep at night. Agree. I, I, I vary. I typically, the other thing, a uh, piece of advice that I give folks is use it whenever you're most likely to use it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so exactly. whenever you can just like exercise, right. It's like when, right. when you can get it in, there's no bad yeah. time. Just get it in, you know, yeah. even like, you know, uh, and I call it, I, I've, I used to call it exercise. Now I, I, I refer to it in my mind as movement and I just want right. to move on a regular basis. And so, yep. but that's just all of just making sure that you you build these good habits that you don't even have to think about it. Same thing with the light, you know, just make it part of your routine, make it part of a habit. You don't have to think about it. So that's really the optimal time to use it is when you're going to make sure that you, it actually gets used. And what's, what's the ideal length of time and how close should you be to the red light device? So the guidance we give is six to 12 inches and to shoot for about 10 minutes uh, per body part. So if you have a panel like yours, you can do 10 minutes on the front and then turn around and do 10 minutes on the back if you want. It really depends, again, on what you're using it for. For me, primarily uh, hormonal health and just general anti-aging. So I always make sure to at least do my front uh, because those are addressed by uh, shining light on the front. Uh, but you know, if I've done a lot of squats or my, my back is sore from doing pull-ups, then I'm absolutely, um, I've got 15 minutes in front of that thing on my back to trying to recover. Yeah, that makes sense. And six to 12 inches. What happens if you get too close? You're like four inches or so. So probably nothing. It's probably yeah. not a problem. We're, we're just, we look at the data and we're hitting around that hundred milliwatts per centimeter squared. And, and you've seen the data and mm-hmm. about six inches. And that seems to be a pretty good sweet spot. If you look at the literature in terms of like where you want to be and, you know, there's some folks like Dr. Michael Hamlin, who's one of the most, probably the most famous researcher in this field. You know, he, he, uh, oh, I hear him say multiple times that he puts the devices right on him and he's just trying to get that energy delivered as fast as possible. Uh, I, and so that's one, that's one viewpoint. I think in general, our, our tact is, you know, take your time. It's only 10 minutes anyway, and cook yeah. the chicken a little slower. And, and you're probably, uh, in, in, you know, we, we view that based on our, our view of the literature that that's, that's a good approach. Yeah. it's probably a little bit more conservative because if you do get too close, right. it has that heating effect. Right. Some individuals may have an adverse response to that. So, uh, so you're trying to avoid that too. Right. And then there's also, uh, for the very health conscious out there, there's also the magnetic field. Uh, right. We get asked this often as well. Folks that are concerned about EMF, yeah. there is a magnetic field that comes off the device. There's a magnetic mm. field off of yeah. anything that has electrical current running through it. Sure. That field more or less dissipates beyond six inches. So if you okay. don't want to be in that field, yeah. then you just be six inches or more away from the yeah. device. So, so win-win. Yeah. And, you know, I actually have my Omni uh, PEMF mat uh, down mm. in my my gym downstairs. So I just put that on. So I'm actually, it's like grounding outside. So I've got these positive electromagnetic frequencies coming in while I'm doing my red light therapy. I love that. I love that. Yeah. I, I, that's you know, another thing I love about light therapy is just these, um, these ideas about how we can stack, stack yeah. the therapy. So I, I have a vibration plate here that I stand oh, on nice. when I'm doing mine. So, uh, but you know, sometimes I'll do squats. Sometimes I'll just yeah. do some breathing work. Sometimes I'll do some curls. Sometimes I'll, I'll read it. I'll, uh, unfortunately check some emails uh, on my phone but uh but you know yeah, I'm with the, you the nice thing is- I'm, I'm trying to stack too so i'll be uh doing breathing exercises i'll be mm. praying and then sometimes i'll be checking emails right <laughs> so, <laughs> yes but uh that we're always uh trying to um, think about new ideas of what we can uh inc- you know use with it a lot of people ask about the sauna as well you know can yeah. they use it in the sauna not recommended 
to put the devices in the sauna because the heat exposure could reduce right. the life of the light. But I've had many customers hang them right outside the glass. Mm. Yeah, so there you sense. go. You know, and you, you, the light doesn't get exposed to the heat, but you still get the exposure to the light. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So what kind of feedback are you getting from uh, your customers, right? What kind of results are, are people seeing? Uh, so it's it varies. I would say the primary piece of feedback we get is improved skin. Yeah. And and that, that is a function. It, it's a biased sample because I would say the probably the most common reason that people buy a device like this is cosmetic. That makes sense. Uh, they're using it for, you know, trying to eliminate the fine lines and wrinkles. Uh, yeah. We sell a lot of these small devices, the Mito Mins. Yeah. Um, and, you know, because it's just easy. You set it on a desk and you sit in front of it and just shine it on your face for 10 minutes and you're done. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, certainly improve skin, uh, improve sleep. And yeah. it's really fascinating to me how many people struggle with sleep. I mean, we talked about it earlier. And I did. I have another side business that I've had for uh, about 10 years now. And um, I did a survey of my customers about a year ago. And two-thirds of them reported problems with sleep. Uh, and some sort of sleep problem. And so uh, and then, so I'm, I'm writing a long article about how to improve sleep. Uh, but uh, many, many people report improved sleep just from using the light. Um, so that's that's very gratifying. And I think that there are it's funny because I I try to really compartmentalize these things and really analyze them. And I think part of the benefits or a big portion of the benefits that people see or report back to us from using the light, are indirect benefits of sleeping better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so if they're sleeping better, they're noticing that they're recovering better from exercise, or they're noticing that they have more energy throughout the day, or they're noticing more libido, whatever the case may be. So um, uh, so that's actually another one that we get commonly is uh, just aches and pains, not, not as bad. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that it's a silver bullet by any means, but some, again, yeah. it varies. Some people, say things and I would encourage people to read the reviews on our site. Um, it's just some of the things are just absolutely mind boggling to me. Like I can't, even as someone that absolutely believes in this technology, I am just blown away sometimes with, with some of the feedback that we get in terms of, particularly with respect to pain, because pain is something that, you know, I mean, when you talk about really damaging somebody's quality of life, like if you have, if you have chronic pain, like I, I, I can't imagine, you know, I have some minor aches and pains, nothing terrible. Uh, and so it's really gratifying to me when somebody says, you know, this is just plaguing me for a really long time and I can't believe how much better I feel. It's really gratifying to me as just personally to hear that, you know? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, and, and then the last one is testosterone, but that is, uh, we've only got a couple anecdotes on that, but it's, I'm very encouraged by the feedback mm -hmm. we've gotten on that where people have actually done labs. Right. And because that's another problem that I think is just, if you look at the data, uh, just our testosterone levels are going down the toilet for, yeah, for some reason. And uh, to the extent that we can help people uh, just nudge them up a little bit, even if from, a, if from a low to a normal, which I think is what, just, just to set real, I, first of all, there's not a lot of good data on this. So we're, we're still stuck in the land of anecdote. But um, the anecdotes I've seen, I've seen people that were had low and they were able to get it to normal or high normal, which I, if that could be replicated and if that's really the case, it, it would just be amazing because it really, as a man, you know, quality yeah. of life and testosterone yeah. go hand in hand, right? So totally, totally. Yeah. A lot of times people think about testosterone, they think about libido and, and muscle growth, but also it really has a lot to do with brain, yeah. your, your mental drive. You know, when men are low in testosterone, they're often depressed, suicidal, um, you know, they don't have drive to get up and go. And so it's just really, really important for overall quality of life. So that is really promising. And, um, yeah. And so I know on, on your, uh, site also, you've got several different types. You've got the Mito red original series. You've got the Mito mod series and the Mito pro series. What's the difference between those? So the original is, is our original line, which was really, yeah. uh, and again, if you go back to, it's kind of the foundation. I was just trying to offer something that was effective, that was powerful, and but it was affordable. Mm -hmm. So really, it's just a light panel, right. and it has the LEDs in there, and they're they're very bright, they're very powerful. But there's no bells and whistles with that light. You buy a yeah. light, and that and that's it. 
And so, uh, again, just listening to our customers, what would happen is, you know, they, a lot of customers would ask, well, you know, do you have a stand that I could put this light on or do, you know, mm. can I connect these together? Uh, and so that was really the genesis for the modular, the mod series, which is the one in the middle, uh, is, and that's really the only thing that we added. We use the same LEDs, but we just, there's functionality for the lights to connect together. There's functionality for the, the daisy chain to power. And it, it is compatible with a stand if you wanted to put it on a stand. So, and so you can build out a larger array and put it on a stand. And, and um, I think we, we offered that last time. Uh, and then the, the Pro Series is really just taking it to the, to the next level where we've got everything in there. We've got the modular capability, the stand capability, the digital timer, control panel, where you can control multiple lights from a single control panel. And, and really for more professional setting where, you know, you can have a wall of lights, you can have a client go in, hit a button, fire on all four lights and, and do a session. Um, and then obviously, and then we also added different wavelengths into the pro series based on some research out of Russia, which we're really excited about. Um, but anyway, that, that's kind of the genesis of the three, the three series and the differences. If you just need yeah. one powerful light, the original series is still the best value. Right. Exactly. That's, you get the best, you get, you get basically a therapeutic light for the lowest cost with that. Um, I'm interested in those, those four bioactive wavelengths that you have on there and the research behind those. But first, I just want to let the listener know that basically, you know, when we think about light, light is information to the cells. You know, I should have said this earlier, but really it's, it's information for the cells, just like nutrition is, you know, we talk a lot about malnutrition or, you know, eating poorly and uh, obviously, you know, having a poor diet, being nutrient deficient, creating chronic inflammation with our diet. Well, malillumination is, you know, really a big problem in our society. And that's where we're getting the wrong forms of light or the, the wrong ratios. You know, we're being exposed to blue light so much in our society, a lot more than our ancestors were. And that's almost like, you know, being exposed to too much sugar, for example, it's going to have the same kind of effect on our body, you know, a little bit of sugar here and there, a little bit of carbohydrate here and there, not a big deal, you know, for doing other healthy things, too much sugar, not a, it's going to be a problem for everybody. It's kind of the same thing. We're being exposed to lots of blue light, you know, not right, getting these, rave, these red wavelengths, right? Near infrared. Now we're going to have nutrient deficiencies. We're going to have inflammation and toxicity. Would you agree? Well, totally. Instead of junk food, it's junk light. Yeah, that we're exposed exactly. To. Exactly. And that's really the best way for us to start to look at it. Because I know for me, when I first started learning about light therapy, I, I just didn't really, I couldn't put it uh, in a certain box. And I, once I started to understand that, hey, really light is information to the cells. It's telling the mitochondria what to do. It's telling them to activate, turn on, uh, you know, things like that. Now I started to understand it more like nutrition. And I think that's really the best approach. So What's helpful about the red light is again, it's, you know, certain, certain, you know, just based on your occupation or different places, you know, or, you know, depending on your, on the weather, things like that, you may not be able to get outside at critical times of the day when you're able to be exposed to these wavelengths. And so this way you can supplement with it at home. So let's talk a little bit about these wavelengths that, uh, that you have in the Mito Pro. I'm looking at your site here. Looks like you've got the, is it, is that the 630 nanometer, 660, 850, 830 and 850? That's right. That's What's right. What's unique so, about those? Okay. So, well, there's very, at least at this point in time in 2020, there's very little um, that's unique about 660 and 850, other than that they are the red and near infrared that are most commonly used and have essentially become the standard. Yeah. Uh, and so- it's interesting. Um, why are they the standard? And uh, I, you know, there's some speculation. I could go into some speculation about that. But 660 essentially is right in the middle of red. Uh, and so, you know, when we say 660, the light that comes out of the LED is actually a bell curve which peaks at 660. So you actually get exposure to light roughly between 620 and 700 nanometers. So you're getting all, all red, but it's really hyper focused around 660. And then and same thing with 850. It's a bell curve between roughly eight and 900 uh, nanometers, uh, but peaking, the peak power is emanating and uh, is being delivered at 850 nanometers. So it's interesting. These have become the standard. And, and again, I think it's par partially inertia uh, in how this, uh, 
industry has developed over the past, say, six years or so, in that these are the standard, and this is what everybody uses. And as new uh, new companies come into the space, they're copying what is out there, trying to gain share. So I think that there's a business aspect to it, and I also think it's just just plain inertia. And then also these are the least expensive LEDs to buy because they are in the highest demand. So there's that circular, that, again, that capitalist function that's happening where um, you can make a, a panel much less expensive using the LEDs that are widely available, which are basically 660 and 850. Yeah. So, um, so in any case, we, and obviously uh, two and a half years in uh, doing research, started with the standard. Uh, and certainly the feedback we've gotten has been great. I mean, you've used the light, you enjoy yeah. it, and, and feedback from customers has been great. But we were going through the literature and we were, you know, there's a ton of research on really on, in many red wavelengths and many near infrared wavelengths for different applications. And uh, so that's the first piece of it. The second piece of it is there's really good research out of Russia, and I put this up on our blog, uh, where they've identified the what, what are the peak action spectra of biological action in red and near infrared wavelengths. And they're actually 620, 670, 760, and 830. Hmm. So uh, I, I kind of ran through that quickly, but uh, so those are the peak action spectra. And I, I've posted those papers on our site. So say those again, 620, 670. 760, which nobody 760. uses. So you'd yeah. be, you and really don't find it. And 830. Yeah. And so, and again, so this is the peak. And again, these are all curves. You have to think about it as yeah. it's, it's degree of, so if you're, if you're in that range, you're going to maximize uh, the biological action. So a uh, so process was, okay, so how do we build on what we, what we currently have, but hit these action spectra better. And so we added 630. So we could be closer to 620. We're not, when so again, it's a bell curve, so we're hitting 620 much better now, and um, and we added 830 because we were able to get 830, and and so now we're hitting three of the four most active biological points uh, pretty well, and so we're very excited that and then and I, I really like your nutrition analogy because I, I think about this in very much the same way. One of the reasons why I eat whole foods and I, and in the supplements I take tend to be whole food based because I know intuitively after you know, learning about this for a long time that there are sin there are synergies in in yeah. that uh, in those supplements that nature has put there whether or not we understand them yet or not and so for instance you know I don't take curcumin anymore I take turmeric because it's Mm. includes all of those uh, constituents right. that are in there doing something and working synergistically because that's how nature made it. And so very similarly, the thought process philosophically is why should we myopically focus on these two points if we can spread the love out a little bit across the spectrum? Yeah. And the science uh, supports it both in um, the studies out of Russia, but then there's also a lot of studies looking at these specific points, which I also, um, um, you know, I, cherry picked the best ones, the 25 human randomized control trials that I could yeah. find on 630 and 830. And those are all in that article that I wrote. Hmm. So we're super excited about it because again, it, it makes sense from a scientific perspective. It makes sense from my own personal philosophical perspective. And the initial feedback we're getting is, is very, uh, very encouraging. Yeah, that's great. And so how did you develop these bulbs? Did you actually manufacture them the like the original or, or create a, a design for them kind of the original design and then and then outsource it from there or did you work with a scientist team uh well engineers primarily yeah. and and yes yeah, so what essentially that's pretty much it i kind of wrote down what i wanted and then i had to go f uh, find engineers and suppliers right. that could provide it uh and that, but it's a lot easier for me to do now because i but three years ago it was it was quite an undertaking yeah. in the beginning uh, but now I've got contacts, you know, all over the world. And so I can, right. I can find these things a lot easier, but, um, so yeah, so that's actually really exciting because I, I was super excited about the pro, but I'm already starting to think, okay, well, what's next? You know, how can we, how can we even make something even better? Uh, but there's also part of it, which is, uh, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. It's the, you know, we know that kind of the standards yield very significant benefits to people. So. Right. I, I don't want to just create something new for the sake of creating something new. Right. Uh, and even even the pro series, I, I when I talk to customers, I, I repeatedly saying, you know, this is a tweak. I mean, these are next door neighbor wavelengths. You know, I'm not this isn't a huge, uh, a huge, massive change. Uh, but but there is definitely reason to believe that it's going to be even that more effective.
Yeah. So you're, you're really new to the market with some of these new wavelengths and you're already thinking ahead to what other wavelengths you can add in. Obviously, as you bring in these new wavelengths, your cost goes up. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Like I said earlier, you can get 660 and 850 nanometer LEDs very inexpensively. Yeah. It, that is not true for a 630 and 830, at least not currently. So, right. uh, and, and, um, but yes, there's, so there's a lot of opportunity. I mean, when you mentioned acne, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to, to how can we comply in blue and red? where you get yeah. the antibacterial and you get the anti-inflammatory, which is going to be the one-two punch for acne, for instance. Right. So there's a lot of things like that. Green light being studied for migraines. Uh, there's, there's just so many different ways that we're thinking about how we can, um, you know, take this uh, business in, the, in, in, a, in different trajectories. Mm -hmm. Although one of the things, uh, again, red light is so super safe that I am almost, I'm somewhat tethered to it because I really want to put out a very safe product. Like right. even the blue light, you know, dangerous for the eyes. Yeah. So you have to be super careful if you were going to bring something like that to market that that's very clear to people. Right, exactly. Red light's very safe. UV light, obviously, like a tanning bed can be dangerous, right? Uh, obviously, health benefits to it, but clearly dangerous as well. And then, uh, you know, blue light, you know, definitely damaging to the eyes, like you mentioned, and also can affect your circadian rhythms if you use it at the wrong time of day. Two, it can drive up yep. stress, drive up stress in the body too, stress hormone. So, uh, so yeah, you got to use it appropriately. Where do you see the future of red light therapy going? <laughs> well, it depends on the time frame. Yeah. Uh, I, I think my, my, my futuristic version, I was funny that you asked me this question because I was just thinking about this today. My futuristic version is that everybody will have a light pod in their home and the pod will run diagnostics on you every mm. time you get in it and wow. will deliver what you need. So that's my futuristic version, wow, right? That would like, be really cool. <laughs> you know, what, I mean, what's like plaguing you? Do a bio scan on you. Right, do a you know, scan. All right, we're gonna, you know, kind of like a Superman thing. both. Yeah, and, and you know, why not? We, we well, let's put the UV in there too, because yeah, exactly. You know, um, you, your vitamin D is trending down. Like, you got to get yeah. some. Let's get some. Uh, so that's my super futuristic version. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do to get there, um, but uh, yeah, I guess like stair stepping it, I could see designing something where you could change the wavelengths in the device. Um, yeah. So that's one way that we can go. Uh, you know, there's, <laughs> this it's really what, what I can envision and what I can finance are two very different things. So, uh, <laughs> of course. so that is one idea. The other idea is, you know, pulsing this idea of pulsing the light uh, and, you know, what, and, and uh, just certain frequencies, that is something that I'm researching to really see, you know, what's there uh, what, where is it, it's just, it's very difficult because I can easily, I can market a pulse product, no problem. Yeah. But this, if the science isn't there, I'm not going to do it. And, uh, and it's just one of the things is that once you add, you know, I mean, you know how science is, once you add a variable, it becomes that much more difficult to understand what was driving the effect. So when you even, even light therapy is complicated, you have, uh, the wavelengths, you have the duration, you know, the jewels that are delivered. Uh, and then you have, you know, um, you know, what, what are the, the controls? Uh, and now when you add pulsing into that, uh, you know, you add that additional variable, it's very difficult to know what is driving the effect and, and was it the pulsing or was it not, or was it something else? Uh, and so, uh, and so that, but that's, I see the industry going in that direction where we're, we're um, evaluating pulsing and where we're continuing to um, investigate, you know, very specific wavelengths for specific applications. Yeah, I think that's really cool. Are you familiar with like cold light therapy or cold light laser uh, yes. How how does bit. that how does that compare to red light therapy and what you were talking about with like pulsing? Well, I'm not super uh, uh, familiar with cold light laser, uh, like the exact actual physics behind it. So I right. I don't know that I, that I can answer that that specific okay. question. Yeah. Um, but you know the pulsing. Yeah, I I don't really the pul. It, it really the pulsing is very comp complex. I'm still getting up to speed on it, so I really don't yeah. want to talk about. Uh, the science for or against it. Mm. I will say that one of the things that has me hesitant about pulsing the light yeah. is that let's say you have a light. So, so delivering light energy to the body mm -hmm. is a function of the power, which is the wattage essentially, and yeah. and uh, and duration, and that's that's how you measure joules. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, our lights put out two and a half joules per square centimeter per minute. Um, now, once you add pulsing and you're turning the light on and off 
let's say the light turns on for 100 milliseconds and turns off 100 milliseconds. In my mind, that is a massive negative because now I have to spend twice as much time in front of the light to get the same amount of light energy delivered to the cells because I'm turning the light off half the time. So, you know, so that's why I'm very skeptical of pulsing in general, unless there are very specific studies and specific applications. But uh, because again, we're trying to deliver a certain amount of light energy in a, in a reasonable amount of time for the, the home user. And so turning it off half the time just doesn't, uh, on its face, I'm very skeptical of that uh, approach. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, I know you guys have this special offer where you're giving away one of your new Mito Pro series. That's the one, guys, with the new wavelengths. So he's got a special offer where, uh, and we'll have a link uh, in the show notes here where you can enter in to win one of these new units that he just created. And uh, so definitely go ahead and do that. And I know you guys do this on a regular basis. You've been giving away units uh, and obviously, uh, you know, your customers, people that purchase these units like, like myself help, help support that. Um, what's been the feedback from doing these giveaway offers? Well, it, almost universally positive. I think people, <laughs> I people so, like right? getting a chance to win Get free nice stuff. Free- and, you know, device, right? and we like giving away stuff, you yeah. know, I mean, why not? Right. So, um, like I said, it's very gratifying, uh, when, when people report benefits and so, yeah. uh, we, we enjoy it. And I know you, you Brandon has been uh, the primary contact. Yeah. It's, he's the brainchild of this, um, really, um, just, this this whole contest model and, um, it's, and I think we're still at the point, even though this industry is a, a good five or six years old, uh, at least. The, the red light panel at home industry. Um, there's still a lot of folks that don't know much about it. And so it's really a good chance to say, Hey, you can win something, you can try it. And at the same time, right. we'll, we'll educate you on this. And, and we, and that's really our goal is to yep. educate folks on it and the, and the benefits. And we really, I do my best to really get devices in the hands of folks, have them use them. And if they're not happy, they can just send it back to me and there's no questions asked, just it's, it's a full refund. And that's always gonna be our policy. And I'm really, um, and I'm, we're very upfront about that. And our return rates are super low and that's also very encouraging. Uh, yeah. that people actually use it. And that's where Brandon is helping me too with a lot of his communications. You know, We follow up with the customers and remind them to actually use it so they can uh, notice the benefits because I know even from my own personal experience, there was a time where it was gathering dust and you can't benefit if you don't actually do it. Yep. And I know a lot of people want to know what's the difference between your units and your competitors. And you've got a great page on your website, uh, which again, guys, I've got linked in our show notes here that kind of goes over it, like your total energy output in 10 minutes, your overall jewels, like you were talking about. So the power divided by the duration, is that correct? Is that how you come up with jewels? Uh, it's the power times duration. Times duration. Yeah, yeah. times duration. Per, per uh, you know, square centimeter typically. Right. So, so you're, putting out, you're putting out more joules. Now, is, is the thought there that the increased amount of joules compared to your competitor there is going to get more mitochondrial activation? Yes. Uh, essentially, well, there's two ways you can think about it. If you're standing in front of a brighter light, and essentially it's it's a brighter light, uh, you can get the same amount of energy delivered to the body in less time, yeah. or you can be a little bit further away from the device, spend the same amount of time in front of it, but get better coverage of the body. Um, so either way, it's win-win. Uh, but again, uh, there's we're, we're trying to find the Goldilocks and the, the Goldilocks right. amount. And so you know, sometimes you know, more isn't necessarily better. So yeah. we are slightly more powerful typically than... Um, than other products in the market, but we're not so grossly overpowered where you know there, you would, uh, where we would uh, be outside the Goldilocks range. Does that makes sense, right? Right. And you also have more LEDs as well. What's the thought behind that? Well, uh, more LEDs is more light. I mean, that's part of that's right. part that's of the. That's how you get the more output. Generally speaking, we also use larger LEDs. So we're able to push a little bit more power through those LEDs. They're physically larger than typically what you'll find in other devices. They're about the size of a nickel and uh, each one. So, uh, so it's a combination of uh, larger LEDs, more of them. Uh, you're able to deliver more, more light energy per unit time. Yep. yep. And guys, you'll like this one right here. His jewels per dollar invested. 
69, which is his, his top competitor is 35. So that's a 98%, uh, basically better value that you're getting. So, um, so, you know, definitely uh, something to check out. So he's got a great page there. It talks about the difference between that and competitors. And when I was researching this about a year ago, I started really researching it, listening to some podcasts, doing some research. And that's where I came across Scott and his company might've read. And um, so this is back in, yeah, like, like 2019 fall. Um, and so I was, I was doing research, you know, I was really looking at what was going on with his competitors and his and really found the mitre red to be the best value on the market. And Scott, what I love, you know, really about our conversation today is you're not just satisfied with, with doing that. You're actually also really pioneering new wavelengths and, and, you know, you're a biohacker at heart. So you're always thinking through, you know, new strategies to make these products better and better. So, uh, so I love that. I love that element of it. So it's a constant progression because again, you know, this whole area is, is new, you know, we don't have it all, all figured out yet. It's new and evolving, but it's very, very exciting. So that's really cool. We know that the, the basic unit, which is the lowest cost unit gets great results, right? However, you know, if you're a, a more advanced biohacker, you want the advanced wavelengths, right? Kind of like the whole food nutrition, then you, uh, then you go for one of those, the Mito Pro. Yeah. And, and I think the nice thing about it, the Mito Pro 300 at 299, uh, if you just want to try it, cause you've never used red light therapy and you're curious, you can get a Mito Pro 300. And then when you love it, uh, you can add on and we, you know, we can get the Mito Pro 1500, which is very unique because it's 42 inches long. So most of the larger panels on the market are only three feet long. And as a matter of fact, even the one you have is only three feet long. Yeah. So we went a little bit longer um, because a lot of folks, they want to get really good head to toe coverage. And with that light, uh, it's 42 inches long. And if you're back 12 inches, you know, you get a good uh, 64 inch footprint and, uh, and it's pretty much head to toe, depending on how tall you are. Um, and so then that's what we're really trying to do is bathe the body in the light and get good systemic benefit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Now you mentioned how red light is really good for, for eyes, right? And it can help with uh, reducing risk of macular degeneration and things like that. Now you do offer goggles with it as well, right? And do you recommend wearing the goggles with it? How do you recommend going about that? Uh, so we do. So we've evolved a little bit. When I first started this business, um, Everybody in the space said, you don't need to wear goggles, but they would provide them. And, and I said, you know, there's always things that we don't know that we don't know. And there's always things that we don't know. So I'm going to err on the side of caution and, and yeah. uh, recommend the goggles. That was our initial. Right. And then we've done more research has come out. And there was recently an article, I think it was even on CNN, uh, about red light and macular degeneration, like we talked about earlier. And now there's even devices, like I mentioned earlier, um, being approved by these, uh, like the European version of the FDA for distribution in ophthalmologist offices. So we've changed our recommendation where, if it's just the red light, uh, no goggles, you know, closing the eyes is fine. Um, near infrared, because there is that warming effect, uh, we recommend wearing the goggles when using the near infrared. Uh, worry about the, the heating of the eyes and whether or not that could be an issue, particularly in high doses. There's some research out there suggesting that it could be in very high doses. Although, again, I was just yeah, listening to a podcast. Inches away. I, well, I, again, I, I personally for years use these devices with no goggles, and I have not noticed any negative effects. However, again, just looking at the research and just out of the abundance of caution uh, yeah. with the near infrared, you know, you know, throw on the goggles um, and we'll see. Although, as I was saying, the um, <laughs> I was just listening to Dr. Michael Hamblin and he had mentioned that he uses 850 nanometers in his eyes. So, <laughs> mm. so this is um, where there is a little bit of a disconnect uh, and a and little bit of um, uh, perhaps still debate ongoing with respect to this. Yeah. So it seems to be super safe. It is the red wavelengths that I've seen the research on for macular degeneration. So, um, and even that, the studies are amazing. It's like two minutes, two minute exposure right. is all so it takes very a few times down. a day, a few yeah. times a week, sorry. And uh, so it doesn't even take much. Yeah. Um, so anyways, that's kind of the long, the long story of where our goggle recommendations are <laughs> currently yeah, sits. You know, it's really interesting because <laughs> there's actually like a whole, whole subculture of people that do something called sun gazing 
where they gaze at the sun in the morning. It's always like the first hour you wake up or the last hour before yep. you go to bed because you don't want the UV. The UV yep. will damage your eyes. So you're really getting the the, the red light specifically, maybe a little bit of near uh, in there, but primarily the red. And, you know, these people, a lot of them do a lot of it like extended fasts and, you know, they just get great healing results in their body. And one thing they do is they build up. So they start with like 15 seconds and they add 15 seconds each day that they're consecutively doing it up till they get like 30 minutes of just staring right at the sun in the morning. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really interesting point. Right. I think, um, that it's probably like with most things or even sun exposure in general, you know, if you're, if you go, if you don't get any sun and then you go out on the beach for, uh, for two hours with no sunblock on Saturday, probably not a good idea, but yeah. if you're getting regular sun, then you right. probably don't need to worry at all. And so, sure. uh, so, you know, the context matters, right. And, yeah. and, and also where your body, your specific body is at, at that moment in time and what it's been exposed to recently or not matters. So yeah, think uh, of it like a, like a hormetic stressor. Right. So kind of like exercise too, if you're a weekend warrior, you're probably gonna be more sore as opposed to if you're getting regular exercise, regular movement in, you know, you're gonna less likely to have the late onset muscle soreness, kind of the same thing here. So you can start small and gradually work up and do something consistently and uh, you have more tolerance. Exactly. And that's exactly what we recommend. Yeah. Well, great. So, so I think, you know, basically a kind of conservative caution there would be, you know, start out, wear the goggles, right? Especially if you're, you you notice that you have more sensitivity to your eyes uh, as you get more comfortable with, with the unit, you know, try taking it off for 15, 20 seconds, you know, looking at the red light, see how you feel, see how you respond. If you feel good, right? Maybe add another 10, 15 seconds, right? And kind of gradually go up until you get to that two minute mark. Yep. And while well, you could even, you can even uh, stagger it more by um, just taking the goggles off and leaving the eyes closed because a lot of right. light makes it through the lids. <laughs> and so, right. yeah. And, and so you could even uh, really, if you really wanted to be cautious and gradually work your way up, that would be like a, another middle step. Yeah. Cause when I stare at it, I get kind of like, like when I, when I'm staring at the panel and then I come off of it, it's like, I have floaters and things like that. Oh yeah. There's no way, yeah. you know, like you know, <laughs> seconds, but at first you're like, Whoa, it's a massive rebound effect and everything yeah. is green. Like the green dots. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, another very, thing very that cool. I, that I get, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. But another thing that I get often is the, um, the lights begin for folks that actually kind of, uh, do look at the lights occasionally, they begin to look yellow. Mm. And it's just the eyes and the brain adapting. The, the lights wow. obviously don't change, but you know, the eye, it's kind of like, a, are you familiar with white balancing for skiers? No, no. So, uh, so skiers, you know, they'll put on, let's say yellow goggles when they're skiing. And, and, you know, you first put on yellow goggles, the snow will look yellow, but after a while the snow starts to look white again. Okay. Like the gotcha. brain just yeah. changes and it's like, no, snow is white. I know snow <laughs> is white and it adapts. It says, no, this, right. this yellow thing is, 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 is pulling a fast one on me. Uh, so it's a similar concept. Uh, you know, you, when you, if you look at these lights, even though they're not changing, they're putting out red light, the brain and adjusts and it can start to look yellow. And folks will often call me and say, is there something wrong with my device? And I'm, I say, no, <laughs> no, there's nothing wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. Really interesting. Well, this, Scott, this has been a, a fantastic interview. I've enjoyed this. I've learned a lot myself. And uh, those of you guys out there that are curious, want to check out more about red light therapy, check out the links in the show notes. Mito Red, what is it? MitoRedLight.com uh, is the website. We've got a special link where you can uh, get an offer for that free Mito Red Pro that he was talking about with the unique wavelengths. So definitely check that out, sign up for it. And then you'll get on the email list where they'll give you more information so you can actually learn more about uh, red light therapy as well. So a lot of great informative educational uh, emails that they put out. So Scott, thanks again so much for your time. And for those of you guys that are out there, go out, start taking action now. And we'll see you guys in a future podcast. Be blessed, everybody. Bye.